Facebook slapped me with nine phony fact checks all in the same day. Plus, why Kamala Harris is the most dangerous woman in all of America. And Joe Biden's painful, awkward, cringy gaffes from the G7 summit. Plus, the five stories the mainstream media refused to report to you. So I will. I'm Liz Wheeler. Welcome to The Liz Wheeler Show. Big tech censorship is absolutely out of control. Man, oh man, do we have an incredible show for you today. But first, speaking of taking your safety and security into your own hands, is that what we were talking about? There are a lot of things I search for online every day that aren't anybody's business. So let me tell you why I use ExpressVPN to keep myself and my family secure. Not only can your internet service provider see every website that you visited, they can subsequently sell your personal data to advertising companies around the world with impunity. They're allowed to do that. So think about what you search for and whether you want that to be secure and what these internet service providers are doing with your information. And you might want to try out ExpressVPN. It's what I use when I search for private things. And I know what you're thinking, well, why buy a product when you can just use private mode on your browser? Well, surprise, surprise, private mode is actually not good enough. It does not hide your activity from your internet service provider. They can still see what you're doing. It doesn't even matter how often you clear your browsing history. They can still pick up every bit of data. That's why even when I'm at home, I never go online without using ExpressVPN. Um, you can visit ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash Liz. They keep all of your information secure. They encrypt 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. So protect yourself. Visit my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash Liz, and you can get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash Liz. Expressvpn.com slash Liz to learn more. Protect yourself online. That's what I do. So guess what happened to me this week? Yesterday morning, I opened my laptop, preparing for the show, to discover that Facebook has slapped fake fact checks on my content. Not once, not twice, but eight times in one day. Then overnight, I got hit with a ninth phony fact check. And when I say fact check, I mean quote unquote fact check. That's right, nearly every one of my episodes so far, and now numerous breakout videos as well, are marked as partially false on Facebook. Thanks to bogus partisan organizations, these are not independent third-party organizations, they're bogus and they're partisan, they wield enormous power over whose content is penalized on Facebook versus whose content is allowed to reach their existing audience, people who have chosen to follow the page. It's so infuriating. And of course, these accusations are disingenuous. In fact, half of the fact check articles are dedicated to topics or claims that I did not make. The tiny, tiny portions of the fact check articles that actually relate to the topic that I was discussing in the episode or the video, where the article names me specifically, for example, it's either a matter of opinion, which can't in good faith be fact checked, or they're simply incorrect about the science, or they're peddling a downright false narrative. For instance, Health Feedback, this is the name of the third party who writes these articles, Health Feedback claims that Dr. Fauci did not contradict himself on mask mandates in his personal emails. Of course he did. Can you read English here? We literally have Fauci's emails in his own words in front of our own eyes. Fauci, being the gigantic fraud that he is, emailed a woman named Sylvia Burwell who asked him whether she should wear a mask. In response, Fauci told her that the particles of the virus were too small and therefore they filtered through surgical masks, so it wasn't necessary to wear a mask. Meanwhile, Fauci the fraud supports government-dictated mask mandates, mandates, even for children, children who are at extremely low risk from the virus, less likely to die from COVID-19 than they are likely to die from the seasonal flu. So did the science change between Fauci's email telling the woman that masks don't work and the current government-dictated mandates that force people to wear masks? No, no. No, no, the science did not change. The driving force behind the mask mandates is ideology and fear and control. So it's perfectly accurate for me to say that Fauci contradicted himself in the efficacy of masks. In his email, he told Sylvia Burwell masks don't work while publicly Fauci says everyone must wear a mask. Here's the other thing to note. As Facebook leverages these ridiculous fact checks against me solely for the purpose of stifling my reach on Facebook and preventing you from hearing the reality of COVID that public health officials like Fauci don't want you to hear, I haven't forgotten that in the trove of Fauci emails, and I I went through them all, 
In the trove of Fauci emails, there was a conversation between Fauci and Mark Zuckerberg in which they discussed using Facebook to control the COVID conversation. Well, I guess we're seeing that in action. Facebook is helping Fauci cover his tracks. It's outrageous. So let's unpack the dishonesty and the partisan propagandizing that's happening here. By the way, this will never shut me up. So eight Facebook fact checks in one day, we're going to materially condense them into the top three. This one comes from the website called Health Feedback. And their so-called fact check says, Danish study does not show that masks are ineffective at reducing the transmission of COVID-19. This is what they write. They said, the researchers of the Danish study included more than 6,000 participants, among whom 3,030 participants received a supply of masks and were recommended to wear a mask, while 2,994 participants did not receive a recommendation to wear a mask. The Danish study itself concluded, and I quote, infection with SARS-CoV-2 occurred in 42 participants recommended masks, 1.8%, and 53 control participants, 2.1%. The difference observed was not statistically significant. So what does that mean? It means there was no statistically significant difference in whether people who were wearing a mask contracted the virus or whether people who were not wearing a mask contracted the virus. That's a pretty big deal. So the, the article's beef was that the study didn't study source control. It only studied prevention. So that doesn't make the fact that the study showed that wearing a surgical mask does not prevent you from contracting COVID-19 any less valid. Remember, I made no claims about source control specifically. I simply said that the Danish mask study shows that masks do not provide you any statistically significant protection against contracting the virus. Source control being, by the way, if you are infected with the virus, whether you transmit it to someone else. Prevention being, if someone else has the virus, does the mask protect you? So the Danish study studied whether the mask protects you. They didn't study if it helps with source control, okay? But I never said that it did. I said it was not statistically significant protection against you contracting the virus. This is also a good time to point out that the mask mandates that we're seeing in our country, they apply to everybody. If we were truly only interested in source control versus prevention, as the article implies, then only sick people would wear masks. And before you even get started, don't give me the asymptomatic people or carriers too, because studies show that the vast, vast majority of transmission of COVID-19 comes from symptomatic people. It's a very small percentage of transmission that happens from asymptomatic people. Yet Facebook told me that I'm wrong, said that that's false information that I'm talking about. It is not. All right, the second one, this is outrageous. The second fact check says Fauci emails, this is, this is almost ridiculous, by the way, it's so absurd. Fauci emails do not support viral claims on masks, hydroxychloroquine, and virus engineering. So first of all, I said nothing about hydroxychloroquine, and in this case, nothing about virus engineering. I was talking about masks. Um, this, is what, this is what the article says. Quote, some interpreted the emails as evidence that masks do not work against the spread of COVID-19. Contrary to these claims, Fauci's emails don't prove that he knew masks don't work. Okay, so we talked about that a moment ago. We can read the email that he sent to Sylvia Burwell but here's the thing. Here's the really important part of this article. And this is crazy that they openly admit this. This is why they're leveraging a so-called fact check. This is what they say, quote, overall, the claims surrounding Fauci's emails build a narrative that attempts to discredit a prominent public health official and in turn cast doubt over the necessity of public health measures taken to combat the pandemic, end quote. Oh, oh, that's the problem. The problem's not what I said. The problem's not the studies I cited. The problem's not my analysis of Fauci's emails. The problem is that my pointing out the reality of what we read in Dr. Fauci's emails discredits a prominent public health official and might cast doubt over the necessity of public health measures taken to combat the pandemic. That is not a fact check. That's censorship. To control the conversation, to purport an ideology. This is partisanship. 
They then proceed to cite studies that they claim show that masks work. There are many studies that claim that show masks work. On the show yesterday, we actually talked about a study that was uh, discussed in the Nature Journal, Nature Magazine, and we pointed out the data irregularities in that study. So there are many studies, sure, that purport to show that masks work, but look at the data and look at the methodology. But that's not even what I said in the original show. What I said was that Fauci contradicted himself, which he did. It's simply inarguable. Okay, they also said, it's, and this is a quote from them, it's important to note that Fauci's statements about masks are consistent. They're talking about the email, by the way, where he's talking to Sylvia Burwell. It's important to note that Fauci's statements are consistent with mask wearing guidance at that point in time when masks weren't recommended for the general public. This was because, they write, health authorities were concerned about a potential shortage of masks, which are needed to protect healthcare workers at high risk of contracting the disease, end quote. Again, this is not a fact check. This is a defense of public health officials trying to manipulate the American public about masks. First telling us, no, no, you don't need them because we want to save them for healthcare workers. And then switching and saying, we're going to make you wear them. That's a political narrative. And what this article is doing is making a defense of a political narrative. They're not fact-checking science. We're just getting started here. The third fact-check that was leveraged against me, an article headlined, what is known about the claim that the Wuhan Institute of Virology conducted research to bioengineer bat viruses? And believe it or not, this one is perhaps the most disingenuous yet. This is what they write, and I quote, one of the questions currently being debated, very key word there, being debated, that means there's no fact. There's competing theories. How can you fact check a competing theory? but I get ahead of myself. This is what they say. One of the questions currently being debated about the origin of COVID-19 is whether the U.S. National Institutes of Health, NIH, funded research on bat coronaviruses that could cause a virus to become more infectious or more dangerous to humans. This, they say, is separate from the question of whether SARS-CoV-2 is a naturally occurring bat coronavirus that jumped to humans or whether the virus was accidentally released from a lab, end quote. They name me specifically in this article. They say, this claim was made by Liz Wheeler in her video podcast, The Liz Wheeler Show, on May 26th of 2021, claiming that the NIH funded research to weaponize bat coronaviruses to attack humans. She claimed that gain-of-function experiments were carried out at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, including manipulating the genome of viruses that naturally infect animals to allow them to infect humans. Wheeler claimed that this would work would make the manipulated coronaviruses more dangerous for humans. So they go on to admit, first of all, this is important, they go on to admit and acknowledge that I was correct in what I said. They admit that the NIH funded the Wuhan Institute of Virology indirectly via EcoHealth Alliance. That's Peter Daszak, you remember him. They admit that what I said, tracing the money, was correct. This is their quote. In her video, Wheeler claimed that the NIH funded research intended to weaponize bat coronaviruses and make them more dangerous for humans. Wheeler added that this work is referred to as gain of function research. Then they say, however, there's controversy among scientists over whether the NIH funded work carried out at the Wuhan Institute of Virology is considered gain of function research. Pause. So let's talk about the definition of gain of function research. First of all, there's no consensus in the scientific community over the exact definition of gain of function research. Rand Paul, sitting US Senator, also a doctor, he says essentially the definition of gain of function um, experiments is juicing up a virus so that they can infect humans, right? And we know that at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, they conducted experiments on bat-derived coronaviruses to infect humanized mice. Humanized mice, that means that there are human cells that are literally injected into these mice so that you can see if that bat-derived coronavirus, which has been manipulated, can infect a human. Because if it can infect the human, it will infect the humanized mice. So it's literally the simplest de definition of gain of function, juicing up viruses to infect human cells. But this article says, gain of function research is hard to define. For all intents and purposes, work that increased transmissibility or enhanced pathogenicity fell under the NIH's definition of gain of function research based on the definition given during its funding pause. Okay. Still not incorrect. Anything I said is still not incorrect. We know that there was a funding 
There was pause on gain-of-function research, funding for gain-of-function research. This is what they said. While funding for gain-of-function research was paused, the EcoHealth Alliance project that was carried out with the Wuhan Institute of Virology was reviewed by the NIH. This is according to the NIH. It was determined that the work did not involve gain-of-function research. Well, funny, because in 2017, there was a description of the bat lady the scientist in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, a description of her research, this is what it says, quote, a 2017 study published by researchers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology listing the NIH as a funding body appears related to this grant, the EcoHealth Alliance one. The researchers wanted to test whether the spike protein of new wild coronaviruses, which they isolated in bats, would allow the coronaviruses to enter human cells. Okay. So you have the definition of gain of function research, juicing up viruses to see if they can infect human cells. They do this through the humanized mice. And then you have this description of Dr. Shi, the bat lady's research, saying that she's manipulating the spike protein of these bat-derived coronaviruses to see if they can enter human cells. That's literally gain of function research funded by the NIH. It's fact checker, fact checker doesn't seem to care about the truth. They admit that there's debate over the definition, that there's no hard and fast definition, yet they say that mine's partially false. How can something be partially false if there's no consensus on a definition? And if you isolate the definition to what most people agree is the definition, then what I said is absolutely true. Of course it's true. And other virologists agree with me, by the way. They agree with me, not with not with the fact check articles. The fact check articles are partisan. They're propaganda. They're defending a political narrative, an ideology coming from the left, from these public health officials, these swamp creatures who don't care about our liberty, don't care about our freedom. They just want us to blindly follow them. And they're willing to use, to weaponize big tech, to censor people who question them like me. Well, I will not be silenced. Speaking of radical leftist strategy and ideology, my good friend Michael Knowles has a new book coming out next week called Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds. You can pre-order your copy today. Now, we talk a lot on this show about the culture wars, cancel culture, and how it's more important now than ever that we do not back down to radical leftist strategy and ideology. But how did we get to the point that these things, this leftist ideology dominates our public discourse over the last quarter century? Michael takes a deep dive into what the past, present, and future of American culture and politics looks like when dominated by political correctness. It's not a pretty picture. It is a fabulous book, however. Michael sent me a copy already for a little sneak peek so that I can honestly tell you, you've got to get this book. It's one of the good ones. Speechless is available for pre-order now, and you can get your copy at speechlessbook.com before it's released in stores on June 22nd, speechlessbook.com by my friend Michael Knowles. I'm super proud of him for writing this book. It is a must-read book. If we know our history, we will not be doomed to repeat it. The left wants us to repeat the past. They want us to be unaware of what's coming for the future, and they're trying to use wokeism as a weapon against us. Don't fall for it. Get speechlessbook.com. Go there to get the book now. Talking just for a moment more about big tech censorship, because it really is unbelievable to see them leverage this, uh, this silencing tactic, these phony fact checks against not just me, but other conservative commentators, other people speaking reality. What should we do? We can sit here and we can expose them. We can commiserate. We can become angry, probably rightfully so, but what can we do practically to stop it? We can repeal section 230 to start with. Do you see how unfair this is? Facebook is a private company, yes. They can set their own rules, yes. But they operate under the privilege of immunity. Immunity from liability for what's posted and what's published on their website because they claim to be a platform and not a publisher. Yet they're acting as an editor, which makes them a publisher, not a platform. You can't have it both ways. Either you act as a neutral platform, and sure, enjoy the immunity from liability for your individual publishers, what they post on your site, or you act as an editor, controlling the publication of opinion and content, and then you do not get the immunity from liability that you currently enjoy under Section 230. Do you know who I blame most for this? Republicans in the Senate. They had a chance to repeal Section 230. When President Trump vetoed the defense bill because there were no provisions to repeal Section 230, and Republicans in the Senate overrode his veto. This is why Republicans lose. 
I expect censorship and unfairness and partisan stifling from committed leftists like Mark Zuckerberg. I do, I expect it. But when it's from Republicans who refuse to play offense on this, who cower and cave and crave validation from the radical leftists who want to silence us, this is why I started the Liz Wheeler Show community on locals. You and I, we have to hedge our bets. We can't sit around and wait for Republicans to protect us from the radical left. We have to create a community where free speech is king. I say whatever I want on locals. I post segments from the show that big tech censors. There's tens of thousands of like-minded people in the Liz Wheeler Show community because we all know we have to fight the culture wars ourselves. And the first step is refusing to back down to big tech censorship, refusing to be quiet, being committed to speaking reality no matter the consequences. So you're always invited to join us over there, lizwheelershow.com slash locals. Okay, Kamala Harris is the most dangerous woman in America. Last week, the Biden administration announced that there had been 180,034 migrants stopped at the border, apprehended at the border in the month of May. Nearly 200,000 migrants. I mean, that's absolutely outrageous. Simultaneously, of course, was Kamala Harris's disastrous trip to Guatemala. Even some mainstream outlets, quietly, they didn't headline this or highlight this, but they very quietly said that her visit was cringeworthy when she went to Guatemala. She went there and she said, don't come here. We're going to turn you back. I think, I believe we turn you back. Do they? Or do they release thousands, tens of thousands of migrants into the United States who've crossed over our border illegally? Regardless, Kamala Harris has not visited the crisis at our border that has been caused by the Biden administration. No, no. She went to Guatemala instead. She said she wanted to examine the root causes of the migrant crisis rather than the border itself. So let's talk about the root causes of the migrant crisis, of the immigration crisis. The root causes are twofold. First of all, it's Biden's fault. Oh, shocker on that one. The Biden administration, the things that they have said, their rhetoric, their promises, their narrative on immigration and illegal immigration is to blame. I'm not saying this just in and of myself. I believe this, but it's not just me who's saying this. The Mexican president literally cited the rhetoric coming from Joe Biden as one of the main causes of what's happening at our southern border. The Guatemalan president specifically said that the things that Joe Biden says about uniting families that illegally cross the border, that that rhetoric is to blame for the current migration crisis. We know what Joe Biden has said from the campaign trail through Inauguration Day up until now. He's promised free health care for illegal immigrants. He said that he wants to decriminalize border crossings. People in his administration have radical positions on illegal immigration. I mean, Kamala Harris is one of the radical, most radical leftists in his administration. They, they don't believe in a border. And that's the second reason. So not only is the rhetoric literally inviting people explicitly and implicitly saying, well, we're not gonna do anything. If you come here, come on here, we're gonna give you lots of benefits. He then puts that into practice with essentially his open border policy. And that's the second reason that that's the root cause of this problem. He stopped building the border wall. He said he was gonna stop deportations for 100 days when he took office. He ended the remain in Mexico policy. He essentially put back into place catch and release. People crossing our border, the migrants crossing our border, coyotes, traffickers, even the cartels who fund this, or who profit off of this, I should say, have specifically cited Biden administration loosening immigration policies from what President Trump has as the reason that they came right now to cross our border. Kamala Harris knows this. She's not stupid. She's a radical leftist. She knows what the root cause of the migration crisis is, of our border crisis. It's her fault. It's Biden's fault. Her trip to Guatemala is a farce. Speaking the truth, speaking of the truth, do you know whose voice I hear every day still in my house? Spencer Clavins. My husband is addicted to his podcast, Young Heretics, and I've been listening to it as well. I actually, I have to admit, I didn't listen to it at first when my husband started listening to it. I thought philosophy, who's got time for that? I was wrong. And I'm, I'm happy to admit that I was wrong. Spencer 
has the most interesting, fascinating takes on ancient philosophy, Western philosophy, and how it applies to modern politics in ways that I probably wouldn't know if I just read the documents myself. I probably wouldn't um, have, I haven't studied it as in-depth as Spencer has. And so his insights are really eye-opening. His podcast is called Young Heretics. So go to youngheretics.com. Uh, subscribe to it wherever you get your podcasts. Spencer is invaluable. He's actually probably the only one in the conservative movement who's speaking about these topics in the way that he is. And it's really incumbent on us to understand political philosophy if we want to fight these culture wars here in our country, which is what you and I do every day. So go to youngheretics.com, subscribe to Spencer's podcast. And if you do, tell him I sent you, youngheretics.com. Okay. Kamala Harris is the most dangerous woman in America, partially because Joe Biden appears to have something seriously mentally challenging happening in his body right now. What I'm talking about is Biden's recent trip overseas. There are three clips, three videos that uh, really make you scratch your head when you watch them. So let's start with the first one here. Um, When Boris corrects Joe Biden publicly because Biden simply doesn't remember something that happened a moment before. Take a listen. Our president, Robert Fraser, President, president Moon, just a minute. And the president of South Africa. And, and, and the president uh, of South Africa, as, 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 I, as I said earlier. Oh, you did. I did not. I, did, I, I, I certainly did. Uh, so, <laughs> but you get going to mention twice, sir. So. I'll go over that again. Let me tell you, we're, we're, we're delighted. I, I'll, Okay, that was awkward. Did you hear the laughter? That was not laughing with Biden. That was laughing at Biden. That's video number one. Video number two, Joe Biden gets lost in a tent. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're in a new place, you're in a giant building somewhere on a campus or a compound and you're not sure where to go, fine. Maybe you don't have a map in front of you, but it's a, this is a tent. You can see where you're going, and Biden still can't figure it out. Take a listen. How are your meetings going in Cornwall, Mr. President? How are your meetings going here in Cornwall? Very well. Come on. They always do. And this is perhaps the most troubling of them all. I. Do you ever feel so uncomfortable you almost feel like you itch when you're watching a video because someone's so awkward, you just feel so, ooh, for how they're behaving? Yeah, that's this, that's this video. Take a look. What do you say to Vladimir Putin? <laughs> to answer the first question? <laughs> I'm laughing too. They actually, I... Well, look, I mean, he has made clear that... Uh, uh, The answer is, I believe he has in the past essentially acknowledged that he was, uh, there are certain things that he would do or did do. But look, um, when I was asked that question on air, I answered it honestly. But it's not much of a, I, I, I don't think it matters a whole lot in terms of this next meeting we're about to have. The second question was, really... Be- I'd verify first and then trust. In other words- and so this, this brings me back to my original point. So Joe Biden clearly has something going on. He clearly doesn't appear to be in full control of his mental capacity. So who controls him then? Kamala Harris. This is a woman who got less than 3% of the, Democrat- the Democratic primary voters meaning she's so radical that even the Democratic electorate rejected her. Now she's vice president, but she's more than vice president because Joe Biden is that. She controls him. By the way, Kamala Harris and her husband, at the same time that Kamala did not go to the border, she did not visit the crisis caused by she and Joe Biden, Instead, Kamala Harris and her husband made an appearance at the Pride Parade this week. 
And the reason that I wanna mention this is because I got a message from a gay Catholic after I talked about the rainbow sidewalks in my town and how dangerous the transgender ideology is. And the message from the gay Catholic was a bit questioning on why I chose this topic to hone into, hone in on. And it, it's a valid question. It's a valid question because he doesn't want to feel excluded. He's both religious and he has same-sex attraction and he didn't see the problem so much. Here's my response. And I think this is really important. Here's the question that you need to ask when there is, especially when there's taxpayer money involved, but when there is such an emphasis on the celebration of an ideology, in this case, the transgender ideology for Pride Month, right? Or the LGBTQ ideology for Pride Month. Here's the question you need to ask. What do they want? What do they hope to achieve with a celebration? So think about that. LGBTQ people in our country have equal rights. They can date who they want. They can love who they want. They can live with who they want. They can hold jobs, they can vote, they can go to church, they can say anything that they want, they can marry whoever they want. They, they enjoy equal rights in our nation, and it's a good thing that they're treated equally under the law. So then, they're not advocating for equality, then it's either one of two things, or perhaps both. Either they want special privileges based on their status as an LGBTQ individual, based on their sexual preferences. They want special privileges, which would mean discrimination against somebody else, or they want you to be made to care. Meaning, they don't just want equality under the law. Okay, that's option number one. So either they want special privileges, or they want very radical sexual behavior to be normalized. This, I think, is inarguable. That's one of their platforms are one of their agenda items in our country right now. You can see this. There's been a 222% increase in LGBTQ characters and stories on children's television shows between the years just of 2017 and 2019. A 222% increase in LGBTQ characters and stories on kids' TV shows in the past two years. Well, between 2017 and 2019. That study was conducted by Insider. So there's an effort being made to indoctrinate children, not just tolerance in adults, but to indoctrinate children in extreme sexual behavior, radical sex ed, essentially. And it's resulting in things like this. This is a video of a young girl who said that just a couple days ago, she realized that she's a guy. Take a listen. Yep. Um. This is kind of scary because I only realized this a couple of days ago and I've only come out to a few people. I'm a guy. What? Yeah. 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 Um, I use he, they pronouns and I'm gonna go by Theo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I told my mom today and I have to go home every day and be called my dead name and have she her pronouns used every time I go home and no one realizes how hurtful it is it's like a slap in the face and I dyed my hair last night so I could feel more masculine and I was afraid I was going to get thrown out of the house we love you Theo we love you so this is my answer to the gay catholic that's the danger of the transgender ideology Clearly that young woman is troubled. She's jumping into the ideological part for the validation days after, at a rally days after realizing this. Clearly has a troubled relationship with her parents, clearly has body image issues. That's what we reject. That's what we ought to reject as a society. We ought to give that girl the care that she needs and not celebrate delusion so that she can feel validated in some way. Again, Kamala Harris is a radical leftist, went to a pride parade that celebrates that type of ideology versus visiting our border. Hence why I say Kamala Harris is the most dangerous woman in America. Okay, now it's time for my favorite part of the show each week, the five stories the mainstream media refused to report, so I will. Story number one, the Wuhan lab, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, 
kept bats in cages in the lab. Now, this might not surprise those of us who've been paying attention to this story. However, the importance of this is that it contradicts this reality that they kept bats in cages, contradicts the World Health Organization, who essentially said that that was a conspiracy theory to allege that there were bats in cages there. So the World Health Organization lied. Again, this story was broken by Sherry Markson on Australian Sky News. Again, critically important because it contradicts the World Health Organization. She actually has footage from inside the lab showing bats in live cages. So the World Health Organization said that was a conspiracy theory. Now we have video that shows that the World Health Organization inspectors were lying. But did the mainstream media report on this? No, no, they did not. Story number two, the Pulse nightclub attack was not in fact motivated by anti-LGBTQ hatred. June 12th, just a couple days ago, was the anniversary of the horrific attack on Pulse nightclub in Orlando by Omar Mateen. This attack left 49 people dead. It was horrendous, horrific. Now this attack was and still is portrayed as an anti-LGBTQ hate crime. We have United States senators, elected officials, certainly lobby groups, claiming that this was proof that the United States is anti-LGBTQ. But the fact of the matter is it wasn't motivated by anti-LGBTQ animus. This was revealed, actually, the motivation was revealed during his wife's trial just last year. The Pulse nightclub was actually just a target of opportunity. The terrorists wanted to attack Disney first but the security was too tight at different Disney targets, so he Googled Club Orlando to find a new target. He didn't even Google Gay Club. That's why he never uttered a single word against LGBTQ people during the attack, though he was talking. He only talked about the US and Syria because there's no evidence that he even knew it was a gay club. It wasn't an anti-LGBTQ hate crime. It was an anti-American hate crime. But did the mainstream media report this as prominent Democrats propagate a false narrative. No, the mainstream media does not. Story number three, Senator Elizabeth Warren says that canceling student loan debt will help the least wealthy in our country. This is what she tweeted. She said, spoiler alert, canceling student loan debt would help people with the least wealth, the most, especially black families that borrow more for college. We need President Biden to hashtag cancel student debt to lift this burden and help close the racial wealth gap end quote. I'm surprised even her social media interns who tweeted that allowed her to tweet something so blatantly false. So let's get one thing straight. Canceling student loan debt is a giveaway to the well-off and elite in our country. And here's why I say this. Only a third of people over the age of 25 have college degrees. And then on average, if you do have a college degree, you will earn about 1 million more during your lifetime than non-college graduates. This is according to a Georgetown University study. Of course, the majority of college graduates come from the middle class or the upper middle class. So if you cancel student loan debt, what are you doing? You're bailing out the rich and the elite, the wealthier portion of our nation, leaving those who didn't attend college, essentially footing the bill for it. But did the mainstream media report that Elizabeth Warren is simply grossly incorrect? Of course they didn't. Story number four. This one's kind of shocking. Half of the pandemic relief money that's supposedly going to citizens over the past year and a half actually went to foreign crime syndicates. It was stolen. $400 billion in unemployment claims were stolen via fraud over the last year. And the crime syndicates that profited from this were in China, Russia, and Nigeria, places where crime syndicates are backed by the state. $400 billion. 70% of that fraud likely went to those foreign criminal syndicates. The rest of the fraud was committed by street gangs domestically. And when the Biden administration was asked about this, they just blamed President Trump. Did the mainstream media report on this horrendous fraud? No, no, they barely mentioned it. Story number five, this one is heartbreaking. As the daughter of a small business owner, the sister of a small business owner, this one hits close to home. The number of US small businesses has fallen nearly 40% due to lockdowns. 
in the last year and a half, 40% of small businesses have gone under. You know who survives, of course, big companies, big corporations, because they can, su- they can suffer financial setback and still survive. But small businesses, mom and pop shops, people who've put their life savings into their work, into their business, have been forced to close forever. Remember when Democrats claimed to fight for the little guy? Remember when they claimed to be anti-big corporations? No, no. Democratic policies. It wasn't the pandemic that caused these businesses to close. It was the lockdowns mandated by Democratic politicians that put these small businesses to death. An additional 35% of small businesses are at risk of permanent closure this year. So the carnage isn't even over. But did you hear this on the mainstream media? Not really, if so, they blamed it on the pandemic itself, the virus itself, and not the government-mandated lockdowns. Since the mainstream media refuses to report on any of this, I will. Okay, we have a lot more to talk about. Unfortunately, we are out of time. If you missed this week's episodes on the six questions to ask about critical race theory and the most egregious lie told by the mainstream media in 2020 that was finally debunked this week, then go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe to The Liz Wheeler Show, download our previous episodes, listen to them, and let me know what you think. In the meantime, think for yourself. Use critical thought, not critical theory. Question authority. Follow the facts and don't let government or corporate wokeism or cultural Marxism or anybody bully you into being a sheep. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. The Liz Wheeler Show is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Chad Abbott. Director of photography, Kevin McRoberts. Editor, Stephen Reyes. Assistant editor, Michael Wall. Assistant editor, Tommy Weber. Sound mixer, Robin Fenderson. Post-production manager, Victoria Metzl. Director of marketing, Emily Washler. Senior publicist, Patricia Jackson. And production assistant, Mickey Pisani. This has been a Soundfront production.